You might not want to set the world on fire, but the Fallout franchise certainly has. Both figuratively and literally. With the release of Fallout on Amazon Prime, everything Fallout related has exploded in popularity and enthusiasm for the series is positively radioactive. I'm a big Fallout fan myself, and the aspect of Fallout that I most enjoy is diving into the lore, reading the terminals in a newly explored vault to figure out what horrible experiments are being conducted, or taking in the environmental storytelling when one encounters a place like Megaton, or the Glowing Sea, or Navarro, or my personal favorite location, the Big Mountain. Now, the world of Fallout has always been pretty fantastical, what with its super mutants and ghouls and nuclear-powered cars and all. But as with all science fiction, the fiction is compelling because it is grounded in reality, and Fallout as a series is built around an edifice of very real geopolitics and history. Which brings us to the question, how realistic is Fallout with its geopolitics exactly? Could there really be resource wars, like the ones that caused the Great War? Could we see a nuclear war erupt between the United States and China that wipes out human civilization as we know it? The answers might surprise you. Let's crawl out through the fallout and find out together. And if your browser sets your RAM on fire, honey, then don't you protest. I just want you to try this video's sponsor, Opera GX. But seriously, folks, if you want a browser optimized for gaming, a browser that doesn't insist on being the center of attention while minimized, if you're the kind of person who enjoys adding Thomas the Tank Engine to Skyrim, or adding all of Fallout 3 to Fallout New Vegas, well, you need to visit operagx.gg slash moonchannel and download Opera GX for free. Other browsers are so boilerplate, so without character, so soulless, and so bloated. But with Opera GX, you can even control how much memory the browser uses by utilizing GX Control. Opera GX can be modded and personalized and turned into a browser that is uniquely you, while also being optimized, nay, designed for gaming. Check out this New Vegas mod I have installed, the second best Fallout after Fallout 2 in my opinion. But you have to give it to New Vegas, it's certainly the most stylish game in the series, which is why we are running with this particular mod. Now with Opera GX, you can mod your browser with themes like this New Vegas one, but also customize the mods that you've downloaded, or install other mods to create a browser that suits your personality and precisely meets your needs. And you can do all of that without invalidating any archives, or fiddling with load orders, or having a next generation patch annihilate your save files almost a decade after the game's release. Sorry, what were we talking about again? Oh yes. What else can Opera GX do? Well, there's integrated RoboBrain support. Opera GX has generative AI integration, including smart AI prompts in your address bar, chat GPT on your sidebar, and even chat sonic image generation. You can log into Twitch from your sidebar and get notifications when your favorite streamer comes online. Why? You can even directly integrate other messengers like Discord, WhatsApp, TikTok, or Telegram into Opera GX. Escape from soullessness. Break free from your boring browser and download Opera GX today for free by going to operagx.gg slash moonchannel or click the link in the description below. 10% of Moon Channel's revenue goes to charity and that includes revenue from sponsors. So please visit operagx.gg slash moonchannel and give Opera GX a try. A special thank you to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Fallout's lore, its history and timeline, is surprisingly deep. The story of Fallout starts way further back than one might think, and it goes way further into the future than one can accurately predict. So here's how we'll go about our analysis. First, we'll build a rough timeline of the lore surrounding the Great War, and then we'll look at some historical context to put the timeline in perspective. Then, finally, we'll analyze the Fallout timeline's events to see how realistic the premise of the Great War actually is, in our own geopolitical reality. It sounds complicated, I know, but I promise it'll make sense as we get started. 
We'll start then with some Fallout Universe historical context. In Fallout, history prior to the 1950s largely mirrors our own with a few exceptions. But sometime between the end of World War II and the year 1961, the Fallout timeline diverges from our own. The result is a United States and presumably a world that is perpetually culturally stuck in the 1950s, with science fiction technology that looks like a 1950s retrofuturistic fantasy. 1961 is an especially important year in the Fallout timeline as that is when larger scale deviations from our timeline start to occur. In our world, the first man in space was Yuri Gagarin, a citizen of the Soviet Union, who traveled to space on April 12, 1961, cementing in the American mind the need to compete with the Soviet Union in a space race. In the Fallout universe, the first human in space was an American, Captain Carl Bell, who traveled to space on May 5, 1961 and then perished on his return trip to Earth. In our universe, the Soviet Union's achievement was acknowledged by other countries, including the United States, and it was undisputed. In the Fallout universe, America's claim was disputed by both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. In 1969, we see in the Fallout universe as well, the United States reorganize into 13 commonwealths, with a new 13-star flag. Something that, of course, never happened in our timeline, at least not to my knowledge. The geopolitically interesting parts of Fallout lore don't really occur until long after present day, in the 2030s and beyond. The premise is this. The world starts running out of petroleum and thus has to turn to nuclear fission as a primary source of power. Nuclear power starts to find its way into everything. For example, in 2037, the Mr. Handy robot is brought to the market by General Atomics International. The Mr. Handy utilizes a CalPower 238B nuclear power unit to power thrusters that can lift the Mr. Handy's 900-pound, 450-kilogram English-accented body off the ground in a steady hover. I'm aware, of course, that in Fallout 4, you can find Mr. Handy fuel lying around and that it gives oil as a crafting material. Your companion Codsworth, however, an upgraded late model Mr. Handy in Fallout 4, also mentions that his thrusters are nuclear-powered. A lot of Fallout lore is finicky and paradoxical in this way, so take everything that we are about to discuss with a pinch of salt. We see nuclear fission used in the Fallout universe for, of course, early nuclear weapons, but also for power generation and propulsion. Cars in the Fallout universe also appear to be nuclear-powered as they often and randomly explode, leaving behind measurable radioactive fallout. Despite the extensive utilization of nuclear power, however, the continuing decline of oil resources causes desperation amongst the various state actors in Fallout. In 2051, the United States imposes economic sanctions on Mexico in order to protect its oil and business interests against alleged Mexican political instability. This is then followed up by the United States invading Mexico to secure its oil industry. In 2052, an energy crisis rips through the United States and the Texas oil fields are shown to be dry. In April of 2052, the European Commonwealth, the rough fallout equivalent of the European Union, inspired by the American invasion of Mexico, invades the Middle East, causing oil prices to skyrocket further. This in turn causes the collapse of the United Nations on July 27, 2052, the destruction of Tel Aviv by atomic terrorism in 2053, and a limited nuclear exchange in the Middle East that wipes out that entire region of the world and causes a global nuclear scare. This nuclear scare led to the United States government initiating Project Safe House, the construction of massive underground fallout shelters known as vaults to protect the American people. Unfortunately, corruption and mismanagement meant that only 122 vaults were ever built, capable of protecting less than one-tenth of a percent of just the United States government. And the vaults themselves turned out to be, we'll say, a bit more experimental than the inhabitants might have thought. The 2050s also saw an infectious disease ravage the world, starting in the United States called the New Plague. Between the new plague and the ongoing resource wars in 2059, the United States started to get desperate, going so far as to station the U.S. military in Canada and establish a front line in Alaska for the express purpose of securing oil resources and preventing potential invasion. A move that would eventually lead to the U.S. annexation of Canada in 2072. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. 
in an effort to both stop the new plague and to develop countermeasures against potential future bioweapons, the United States, through the nationalized West Tech Corporation, develops the Pan Immunity Virion, which, while intended to be a general immunity agent, ends up resulting in the invention of FEV, the forced evolutionary virus, much later in the timeline. In 2060, fuel reserves finally run out worldwide, with cars literally being abandoned on the streets as fuel becomes too valuable to waste. The automotive industry attempts to plug the gap by coming up with electric and fusion cars, but these efforts are too little, too late. Throughout the 60s, tensions grow between the United States and the other global superpower, the People's Republic of China, until a breaking point occurs. In 2066, the United States makes a breakthrough in fusion power, potentially solving once and for all the global energy crisis. But as we see in the Fallout TV show, the end of the world had already become a product by the time fusion power was invented, and it was in the interests of powerful companies such as Vault Tech to politically sandbag any attempts at peace or energy stability. That said, the Fallout lore bible suggests that the United States does begin to incorporate fusion technology into its infrastructure and economy, while simultaneously refusing to share the technology or open its oil reserves to the People's Republic of China. Instead then of allowing their country to collapse, the Chinese decide to invade Alaska in December of 2066 to seize American oil resources therein. The Chinese invasion initially succeeds as the American military retreats from Alaska. The U.S. then pressures Canada into granting the U.S. military access to Canadian soil, which leads thereafter to the annexation of Canada in 2072. Utilizing its fusion power advantage, though, the United States is able to develop power armor technology, which is deployed to the front line in Alaska, preventing further Chinese incursions. A stalemate forms, with neither side making progress. The Chinese are able to use the resources they took in Alaska to fuel their war effort and the Americans pillage Canada, destroying its forests and using up its natural resources in the process. In 2074, despite the stalemate in Alaska, the United States somehow launches an invasion of China itself, with fighting taking place in, according to various lore scraps in the game, Santo, the Gobi Desert, and Nanjing. The Chinese and Americans are now fighting along three massive fronts in Alaska, in Canada, and all over China. The Americans then come up with a new model of power armor which breaks the stalemate. The deployment of the T-51B power armor in China turns the tide of the conflict for a while, only for the Chinese to rally and resist the invasion efforts once again. The seams of both countries are beginning to fray, with the unstated nations annexed by China beginning to revolt, as well as the American people in the US proper. Food and energy riots break out all over the United States, fueled in part by Chinese infiltration. The US government ratchets up that fear through propaganda in hopes of securing the support of the American people, which culminates in Chinese Americans being rounded up and placed in concentration camps. Many of these Chinese Americans are then used in cruel government-sponsored scientific experiments, such as the ones conducted in the Big Mountain facility. In 2077, the success of the T-51 finally allows for the United States to break through the Chinese lines in Alaska and the US liberates Anchorage. This in turn galvanizes the American war effort in China proper, only for the conflict to turn once again into a stalemate by October of that year. With the war at a stalemate yet again, and both the Chinese and American economies and peoples at a breaking point, nuclear conflict seems inevitable. The Chinese no longer have Alaska to fuel their war effort, and they have to fight against the seemingly unstoppable might of American fusion power. But in the United States, massive military overruns, corporate corruption, a war-weary and depleted populace, and a revolting Canada also threaten to collapse the nation. Peace negotiations are held in hopes of ending the war, but it is not to be. The negotiations are apparently sabotaged by American corporations with a fiduciary interest in the end of the world. The American government, in the meantime, retreats to various remote locations, enclaves, if you will, like ocean-based oil drilling platforms in preparation for the inevitable. With negotiations having failed and the situation at a breaking point, the Chinese launch a nuclear strike at the United States, the first volley of the Great War. On October 23rd, 2077, at 9.13 Eastern Standard Time, the United States detects four missile launches. At 9.17, NORAD confirms that these are nuclear missiles. 
At 926, the President of the United States orders a retaliatory strike. And at 942, the first nukes land, striking Pennsylvania and New York City. The end of the world has arrived. Confirmed reports, I repeat, confirmed reports of nuclear detonations in New York and Pennsylvania. My God. So there's our timeline. But how realistic is all of that exactly? Could the world see such a nuclear war or resource war or Sino-American conflict erupt in our future? In the way that it did in Fallout? In order to properly analyze the lore, we have to first consider when much of this lore was written. Fallout 1 was released in October of 1997. My personal favorite Fallout game, Fallout 2, was released in 1998. And the Fallout Bible, which is a collection of design documents that would go on to inform the rest of the lore, was first released back in 2002. So in some respects, the lore of Fallout is incredibly prescient. It predicts a lot of different geopolitical developments that weren't apparent back in the late 90s. Some of these incredible predictions were mere coincidence. The elephant in the room throughout this geopolitical fairy tale, of course, is the absence of Russia. We don't learn much about what happened to the Soviet Union in the Fallout lore, and as we will soon see, the entirety of the lore surrounding the Great War, from the European invasion of the Middle East to the invasion of Alaska to the counter-invasion of mainland China, it's all written as if Russia simply sank into the ocean and disappeared. And the reason for that is actually quite fascinating. Russia, or more specifically the Soviet Union, was originally imagined as the geopolitical adversary of the United States in Fallout, as virtually all fiction of the time was wont to do. But our Scott Campbell, one of the main writers of Fallout 1, changed Russia out for China, pursuant to the following anecdote. The story goes, a few months prior to Campbell's work on Fallout, he was assistant producing a typing game. As he spoke on the phone to a colleague of his, a Russian developer named Oleg, based out of Moscow, Campbell heard, and I quote, some muffled bangs, and the phone went quiet. When Campbell then asked Oleg what the noise was, Oleg replied, oh, it was just the Russian mob firing their guns in the street. Campbell recalls then in his own words, I had a really hard time believing that the once mighty USSR would be in a position to threaten the world anytime soon. So I turned to the next major communist country that typifies the East, China." End quote. As we know, Scott Campbell wasn't the only person to have that thought. China in the late 90s was not the scary geopolitical superpower rival of the United States that we here in the US often believe it is today. As per World Bank estimates, back in 1997, China had a GDP adjusted for purchasing power parity of around $2.7 trillion. The United States had an economy roughly three times larger with a GDP PPP of $8.58 trillion. And to offer an in-between comparison, Japan had a GDP PPP of $3.23 trillion. China was not wealthy back then, and it's important to keep this historical context in mind. The People's Republic of China opened its doors to foreign investment in December of 1978 thanks to Deng Xiaoping's open-door policy. The Cultural Revolution had ended only two years prior in 1976. And 1976 is six years closer to 1997 than 2024 is to 1997. In the 1970s, China was destitute one of the poorest countries in the entire world. The World Bank estimated in 1978 that China had a lower GNI per capita than sub-Saharan Africa. And though China had developed its economy a great deal by 1997, it was almost preposterous to think of China as a political rival to the United States back then. And the threat of nuclear war in the late 90s? Well. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, atomic annihilation seemed like such a faraway threat that it became safe to joke about again. The Cold War ended with an all-around American victory. Thanks to Nixon, Deng Xiaoping, and the Sino-Soviet split, the remaining communist power was our dear friend and trading partner. In the year 2000, China joined the World Trade Organization. There was enthusiasm that China might even soon liberalize as its economy continued to grow. On March 9th in the year 2000, President Bill Clinton said the following at a speech at Johns Hopkins University concerning the China trade bill, and I quote, 
supporting China's entry into the World Trade Organization is more about our economic interests. It is clearly in our larger national interest. It represents the most significant opportunity that we have had to create positive change in China since the 1970s, when President Nixon first went there, and later in the decade, when President Carter normalized relations. I am working as hard as I can to convince Congress and the American people to seize this opportunity. Skipping ahead to the end. So if you believe in a future of greater openness and freedom for the people of China, you ought to be for this agreement. If you believe in a future of greater prosperity for the American people, you certainly should be for this agreement. If you believe in a future of peace and security for Asia and the world, you should be for this agreement. This is the right thing to do. It's an historic opportunity and a profound American responsibility. End quote. I've told you all of this in order to show you two things. The first is that choosing China as the enemy of the United States back in the 90s was something of an intentionally silly choice, as many things in Fallout are. It was a cartoonish decision. Radiation doesn't grow extra limbs or turn you into a ghoul. Giant needles full of stimulants can't fix internal hemorrhaging. And China as a political rival to the United States? In the mind of a post-Soviet late 90s America? You mean a poorer than sub-Saharan Africa friend of the United States, Ronald Reagan's so-called good commies, China? That China as a rival to a Cold War victorious America? The very notion was simply preposterous. But reality can be stranger than fiction sometimes, can't it? As we dive deeply into our Fallout timeline, this will only become more and more apparent. And as we continue our analysis, I will also ask you to keep this in mind. Our analysis will at times be more America-focused than China-focused. And that's because Fallout is also largely a satirical interpretation of American culture and history made by Americans for American consumption. As we just saw, China was a silly opponent, and the Fallout lore doesn't go deeply into what China was actually doing. The choice of China as an adversary in Fallout was almost completely arbitrary if one considers the geopolitical context of the late 90s. There is another element of Fallout's lore that is deeply tied to the geopolitical context of the late 90s, and that is the nature of Fallout's resource wars. The resource wars in Fallout are fought over oil, over petroleum. Now, in many ways, this is quite prescient. The United States has participated in a few different conflicts over oil since the late 90s, but this was also not without precedent. The Gulf War fought in 1990-1991 would have been freshly in the minds of the Fallout writers, what with its famous burning oil fields and all. Secure access to the allegedly dwindling global oil resources throughout the 90s and early aughts was treated as a matter of utmost importance due to a concept known as peak oil. In 1956, American geologist and geophysicist M. King Hubbard, taking note of the fact that oil is a non-renewable and limited resource, predicted that the world would reach the apex of its oil production sometime around the year 2000 after which point oil extraction would steadily decrease until global oil resources were totally depleted. Oil, of course, is important as fuel, but we use crude oil for an astonishing amount of different things outside of fuel. The production of everything from fertilizers to pharmaceuticals to plastics depends on oil. You can power a city with a nuclear power plant, but you can't grow crops or make toys with strontium-90. Now, if you know peak oil is on its way all the way back in 1956, surely the wise thing to do would be to prepare to transition away from oil before peak oil arrives. But national interest is always trumped by corporate interest in the United States, and oil companies have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. Thus, the United States entered into the forecasted era of peak oil in a state of panic, which led to the United States and its European allies waging resource wars for oil in the Middle East. Am I talking here about Fallout or real life? You can't tell, can you? Well, in our world, the price of oil rose dramatically, peaking in 2008. But thereafter, something curious happened. Turns out, number one, there is a lot more oil in the world than we thought, in more forms than we thought accessible, and 
Number two, there are new technologies that we can use to better harvest the oil we've already discovered. Thus, instead of oil production peaking in 2000, we are currently predicted to reach peak oil as far out as 2030. And as we develop further technologies and simply go searching for more oil, I imagine that date will be pushed out even further. Consider, for example, the story of Guyana. Guyana went from one of the world's most impoverished countries to one of the world's fastest growing countries after oil extraction began there as recently as 2015. We are finding more oil and utilizing the oil we have more efficiently. So the initial premise that inspired the resource wars in Fallout, that peak oil would arrive in the 2000s, turned out not quite to be true. But again, here comes coincidence, because Fallout has the world panicking in the wake of peak oil all the way out in the 2030s, at which point the United States starts to develop fission technology and eventually fusion technology, though it is too little and too late. We've talked a lot about the United States so far, but what about China? Well, in the late 90s, China was not the oil-thirsty importer that it is today. Its larger-scale industrialization was just getting underway. But China watched the U.S. meltdown over securing oil resources, and it began its own journey towards energy security. Let's flash forward to the present with a simple question. Let's assume the fallout timeline is correct and peak oil arrives in the 2030s. Right now, which country is better preparing for that inevitability? And the ways that Fallout anticipates is the correct mode of action, which is to say, investment into alternative energy, namely nuclear energy and fusion power. As per the World Nuclear Association, the United States has 94 operable reactors with 96,952 megawatt electric. That's 96,952 million watts of electric capacity. WorldNuclear.org reports that the United States has no new nuclear reactors under construction. China has only 56 operable reactors with an electric capacity of 54,362 million watts. However, China is currently constructing 26 new reactors with an electric capacity of 27,810 million watts. China is behind, but it's catching up, and the United States is the one slowing down. In the race for fusion power, the United States is also ostensibly ahead, but the numbers here aren't as clear-cut. Japan, South Korea, France, Germany, and the UK, for example, are all investing heavily into fusion energy research. The United States has the lion's share of private investment into nuclear fusion. But Nikkei Japan reports that China has filed more patents in nuclear fusion technology than any other country over the past decade. Thus, it's uncertain if China will actually quote-unquote lose the nuclear fission or indeed the nuclear fusion race. Never mind other areas of clean energy like solar or hydro, where China has already overtaken the United States by capacity. Chinese interest in and investment in a nuclear future is exceptionally robust, and rivals if not overtakes American investment in the same. How that might all pan out 30 years in the future, however, is not something any of us can reasonably predict, especially not when it comes to fusion power. It's worth noting, of course, that Fallout puts a heavy emphasis on nuclear energy, both for its theming, but also because other green energy technologies, particularly solar and wind, were relatively undeveloped in the 90s. In the Fallout universe, electric cars don't even make their appearance until after gas-slash-petrol-powered cars are being abandoned on the streets, whereas electric cars are already a common sight today in the United States, Europe, and China. So back to our premise. Is the arrival of peak oil going to catch China, Europe, and the United States off guard? It seems like, at least for now, the answer isn't a guaranteed yes. This doesn't change the fact that we have seen and will continue to see conflicts waged over and around oil. But will the European Union launch a full-scale invasion of the Middle East that ends in a regional nuclear war? I don't think so. But hey, the Middle East is the Middle East, and you know, I don't want to jinx it. Okay, but let's turn our suspension of disbelief dial up a notch. What if the United States and Europe and China do end up unprepared for peak oil and a mad scramble for oil resources does occur? Will Europe invade the Middle East? Will China invade Alaska? It's heavily implied in Fallout that China annexes Southeast Asia and maybe Oceania for its oil, and Europe collapses after seizing and then losing Middle Eastern oil. China invades the United States for its oil in Alaska, and the United States annexes Canada and invades Mexico to seize their oil. 
think about it with me. Are we forgetting a few places in the map here? Well, for one, we haven't discussed the rest of Africa outside of the Middle East, South Asia, South America, or the death claw in the room, Russia. As we speak, Russia and China are building a lot of economic ties in Africa specifically to secure natural resources, and in China's case, that includes oil resources. You might not know this, but China actually gets a lot of its oil from Angola. Nigeria has proven oil reserves more than four times larger than Norway's, an amount that is almost the size of the proven reserves of the United States. When the European Commonwealth invades the Middle East to seize its oil, does the European Commonwealth include the Balkans? Does it include Turkey? You're telling me that France, the UK, Germany, Spain, Italy, and what, Romania, Switzerland, choose to invade through the Balkans, through Turkey, and into the Middle East? And that somehow, the Chinese and the United States just keep their eyes locked on each other while the Russians run around in circles? It's all geopolitically very unlikely. But if Fallout's 1950s version of 2050's perversions puts on a show, then anything goes. South Asia, and particularly India, is a massive consumer and importer of oil that has virtually no presence at all in Fallout's lore. It's also a region rife with tension and conflict, with a resource shortage far more pressing than that of oil in the form of water. South America is full of oil. Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. More than Saudi Arabia, by a factor of the United States. Venezuela has more proven oil reserves than Russia, the United States, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Norway put together. And using 2021 figures at Venezuela's current rate of production, it will not run out of oil for another 1,000 years. So really, if the fallout peak oil scenario were to happen, it wouldn't make much sense for the United States to invade Mexico for its measly 5,800 million barrels of proven reserves. It would make much more sense for the United States to invade or stage a coup in Venezuela. Hmm. Moving right along, we now finally get to Russia. And Fallout acts as if Russia just doesn't exist as a state entity. When the Chinese invade the United States, they suddenly pop up in Alaska. When the United States invades China, its depleted military, the same military that is struggling to retake just Alaska, can magically launch a counter-invasion that simultaneously targets Santo way down south in Guangdong, Nanjing in the heart of China proper, and also like the Gobi Desert somehow. Why the Gobi Desert? You know that most of China's oil is in Xinjiang, right? Uh, there's literally not a single worse place that you could choose to invade China from than the endless logistical nightmare of sand and nothingness that is the Gobi Desert. It's arguable even that if you're going to launch a full-scale invasion anywhere in the world, the Gobi Desert might be the single worst place to launch your invasion from. Fallout can be, again, intentionally silly in these respects. In any case, none of these scenarios is likely to be logistically feasible without either crossing from or operating from Russia. Let's get a bit deeper into the lore here. In Fallout 1, we have a Russian playable character, Natalia Dubrovsky, said to be the granddaughter of a Soviet diplomat who took shelter in Vault 13. There's a corollary theory that in the Fallout universe, we had a reverse Sino-Soviet split, where the Chinese became the primary ideological rival of the United States and the Soviet Union became our so-called good commies. If this is the case, it makes a bit more sense why the Soviets might not interfere in the Middle East and might allow the United States to operate against China. If China and the Soviet Union are rivals, and the Soviet Union is friendly with the United States, the Soviets might allow US operations in Russia and stay out of Europe's pursuits. After all, Russia has more than enough oil for its own needs. And therein lies the rub, because invading Alaska, and thereby the military superpower that is the United States, for Alaskan oil makes virtually no sense when Siberia is right there, is poorly defended, and can be accessed by land instead of having to deploy one's military all the way across the North Pacific in order to make an amphibious landing via the Gulf of Alaska. Or worse, the godforsaken Bering Strait getting your landing ships tossed around like crab pots on the deadliest catch without anyone somehow noticing that you're on the way. Now to be fair, most of Russia's oil isn't in East Siberia, it's in West Siberia, north of Kazakhstan. But it would make much more sense for China to invade Central Asia and West Siberia for those oil resources first, before attempting an ocean-wide amphibious invasion of the United States. 
so even if the world is totally unprepared for peak oil. It's highly doubtful that a conflict between the US and China would emerge over Alaska, not when Russia has all that oil for China to ostensibly devour, or when Venezuela is just sitting there menacingly. And if China and the United States did somehow go to war, a full-scale amphibious invasion across the Pacific in either direction would be incredibly silly. We've already established in the Fallout universe that satellites exist, and so both sides would be able to see the other one coming. If such an invasion was clear and nuclear arms were already on the table post-Middle East, then the invading force would likely be nuked before it even landed. Which brings us to our final analysis on the nuclear war itself. In the 2070s, the United States is in China and both countries are at a breaking point. The US government retreats to the vaults and hidden military bases including converted offshore oil drilling platforms. US companies with a financial interest in containing war succeed in preventing peace. And then China shoots first, consuming the world in nuclear fire. Let's start our analysis by looking at the United States. The notion that the US government might prepare for the eventuality of nuclear war by building fallout shelters or giant mountain facilities isn't so crazy as that is something that actually happened. But conducting heinous government-funded experiments on an unsuspecting public? That would never happen. Except, of course, it did. Consider, for example, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, conducted by the United States Public Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this study, 600 impoverished black American men were split into two groups. 399 of these men had latent syphilis, while 201 of them did not. The men were told that they'd receive free health care, but none of them were told about their syphilis diagnosis, and they were given various ineffective quack treatments and placebos for so-called bad blood. The study was supposed to last for six months, but it ended up being over 40 years, running from 1932 to 1972. Funding for treatment was lost relatively early on, but the nearly 400 syphilis-infected black volunteers were not told about this. As early as 1947, antibiotics were widely available to treat syphilis, and the suffering of these men could have been ended. Instead, the men were purposefully left untreated until 1972, when the study was terminated, not out of the goodness of anyone's heart, but because the study was leaked to the press. By that time, 28 of the patients had already died directly from syphilis. 100 more of them died from complications related to syphilis. 40 of the patients' wives were infected with syphilis, and 19 children were born with syphilis as a direct result of this inhumane study. Consider also MKUltra, a series of horrifying mind control and torture experiments conducted by the CIA on students prisoners, drug addicts, and even Canadians between the years of 1953 and 1973 using, and I quote, chemical, biological, and radiological methods. The details are a bit gruesome, so I won't get further into that here. Maybe we can talk more about this subject if we do a separate episode one day on the lore of Big Mountain or something. So yes, secret vaults, horrifying torture experiments of dubious scientific value, it's all within the American wheelhouse. But it's a bit fantastical to see the US government building remote operating bases on offshore oil platforms, as was the case in Fallout 2, in order to preserve its chain of command in the event of war with China. Right? Except, of course, that's also happening as we speak. Just a week prior to the publication of this video, the US Navy announced that it is converting surplus oil rigs in the Pacific into mobile military bases. So there you have it. Fallout proves once again that reality can be just as silly and just as grim as even the most satirical of fiction. But on to the topic now of nuclear war. When the guns are drawn, China shoots first. The first few nukes land in Pennsylvania and New York, and the resulting exchange ends the world. Now I understand that a lot can change between 2024 and 2077. But given the information we currently have on both Chinese and American nuclear warfare doctrine, a full nuclear exchange between the United States and China isn't likely to be nearly as devastating as fallout makes it out to be. For you see, though the United States has a stockpile of 3,708 nuclear warheads as of 2023, 
the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists estimates that China has a stockpile of around 500 nuclear warheads as of 2024. That doesn't mean that this number can't grow, of course. The Pentagon claims that China is aiming for a total of 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. Uh, but the Pentagon claims a lot of things. Fallout is styled after the 1950s, though, and so if we play ball using Cold War rules, well, the United States had at peak stockpile circa 1967 31,255 nuclear warheads. But even with that many warheads, nuclear warfare doctrine is a real thing, and it is good doctrine not to start a total nuclear war by targeting civilian centers of population. Here's why. Yes, you have this huge stockpile of nuclear warheads, and yes, you have a ton of missiles with which to use them, but you can't put all of your warheads on all of your missiles to launch all at once. You need to fire in volleys, and as such, in a total nuclear war, your first volleys need to destroy as many of your opponent's launch sites and missile defense systems as possible. If you shoot first and can knock out almost all of your opponent's launch capacity, you have a very real chance at winning the war with minimal casualties. The Federation of American Scientists estimates that China has approximately 140 loaded ICBM launchers and between 300 and 450 total ICBM launchers. The US Air Force has about 400 silos with loaded missiles and another 50 silos ready to go. And of course, we don't really know the operational capacity of, say, ballistic missile submarines. So even if China fires first and successfully lands all 140 ICBMs on US targets, it can expect a counter volley larger than what it fired. As such, it needs to prioritize a second volley fired quickly to take out US sites or otherwise start building additional nuclear weapons capabilities, which it does appear to be doing. That's pretty grim, and so we'll give Fallout a realism point for that one. This having been said, it's important to note that China is also the first nuclear weapon state to make a public NFU pledge. Unconditional no first use. To be specific, China has stated that it will both not be the first to use nuclear weapons at any time or under any circumstances, and that it will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against any non-nuclear weapon states or nuclear weapon-free zones at any time or under any circumstances. And to China's credit, even at the peak of their brinkmanship, that pledge appears to be both true and taken very seriously. China's nuclear arsenal is a deterrence, but of course, Resource wars and desperation can change a lot, so what applies today may not necessarily apply tomorrow. What this nuclear warfare doctrine teaches us, though, is that nuclear bombs aren't likely to start falling on cities until one side or the other gets desperate, in which case, given current numbers of nuclear weapons, it's likely the United States and even China will emerge with major cities and regions unscathed. We see in the Fallout TV show that Shady Sands, the capital of the new California Republic, had a population of 34,000 people before its demise. The United States has well over a thousand cities with a larger population than Shady Sands. And thus, even if every Chinese warhead is the largest nuke ever, the Tsar Bomba, which they aren't, and every single nuke is fired at a civilian population, which they won't be, and every single nuke hits dead on, which isn't likely, there simply aren't enough nuclear warheads in China's entire arsenal to wipe out even half of US cities over 34,000 people, let alone end global civilization. And China being much more populous is likely in a similar position to the United States. Even if all 3,708 American nuclear warheads target civilian populations and land dead on, there will likely be cities full of people that are untouched. The world is very large, and there are a lot of people. Inevitably, there will be surviving populations. Civilization, though greatly injured, will yet persist. Nuclear war is a pretty heavy topic. Given current world tensions and ongoing conflicts, the possibility of nuclear war no longer seems like the silly impossibility that it was in the late 90s, in the post-Soviet American hegemonic decade. We talked a bit about Sino-American relations in the 90s, and about peak oil and resource wars, and about nuclear warfare doctrine, all within the context of Fallout lore. But you'll notice that I didn't theorycraft a real-life scenario in which China and the United States do go to war. I didn't talk about the already occurring resource conflicts over fresh water or the importance of the Malacca Strait or Taiwan. 
And that's because while the premise of Fallout is silly and fun and all but pure fantasy, the satire is rooted in reality and real world conflicts are no laughing matter. I can't tell you what the future holds. Maybe the world will fight over oil like Fallout predicts, or maybe not. Maybe we'll fight over water instead of oil, or we'll fight for national pride or sovereignty or because of the actions of a self-interested and corrupt world leader. Maybe it won't be China and the United States that end the world. Maybe the world won't ever end at all. The future isn't ours to know. But I can tell you one thing for certain. No matter what happens, regardless of the variables, oil or no oil, nukes or no nukes, there will be war. Because although the conditions of it may change, war, war never changes. I've been your host, Mooney. There are a lot of Fallout-related topics that I didn't get to in this video, like FEV or Big Mountain or vault Tech or the Enclave. If you are interested in more Fallout content, please let me know in the comments. Please also consider supporting Moon Channel on Patreon. It makes a world of difference. A special thanks to all of Moon Channel's generous patrons, to our sponsor, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel. Dear Mooney, why don't you have any social media presence? Why aren't you on Twitch? Aren't you interested in being an influencer or having a more marketable presence? Well, that's a good question. Let me see if I can answer that for you. Each morning, a YouTube maker gets a new contract to sign. He tells his YouTube audience that Opera GX is fine. But three favorite commenters, all are from the top sticky. More content creation is a thing they'd like to see. Oh, Mooney, 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 he don't wanna leave the boonies. Oh, no, 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 no. Looney, Tooney, Mooney, I'm so happy in the boonies, I refuse to go. Don't want no TikTok, Facebook, Twitch, or Twitter, I make it clear that no matter how they coax him, I'll stay right here. They hurry like savages to get aboard a new hype train. Brought to you by our friend Opera GX. And though it's crazy overcrowded, they're too desperate to abstain. Don't forget to visit us on Patreon. On Amazon Prime, they will pay many bottle caps to see. Just to complain about lore that pre existed Fallout 3. So, Mooney, 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 I don't wanna leave the boonies. Oh, no, 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 no. Looney, Dooney, Mooney, I'm so happy in the boonies, I refuse to go. Don't want no Reddit, Insta, Twitch, or Tumblr, I make it clear that no matter how they coax him, I'll stay right here. They have things like the X.com, so I think I'll stay where I am. Content creation, I'll stay right here.